the next item is uh, Lorna Gillings, who is from the Utility Consumer um, Office of Consumer Services, the Consumer Assistance Specialist. Welcome, Lorna. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. This report describes the work that New York's energy utilities and the department are doing to provide customers with information to help them manage their energy usage and build this heating season. The 2013 winter season had unusually cold weather, which caused the price of gas and electricity to surge throughout the state and throughout the Northeast. In New York, the temperatures were 10 to 15 percent colder than normal. In January, New York set an all-time new winter record peak demand for electricity, and the term polar vortex is now a familiar terminology to most of us. As you heard in, uh, as you heard in the previous presentations, prices last winter were substantially higher than in the recent past. To reduce the chances of this happening again, staff began working with the utilities to implement changes for the benefit of utility customers. The outreach and education efforts of the department and utilities this winter will highlight these changes. The first change is increased utility hedging to reduce the risk of volatile prices, particularly for electricity. Again, previous presentations provided the details on this effort. In addition, outreach programs have been enhanced to include information about the increased availability of fixed price commodity from energy service companies. For example, last year, this time in Con Edison's territory, there were about five ESCOs offering fixed price options for electricity. In May, there were 25, and today, there are approximately 38 ESCOs offering fixed price options for electricity. Customers are encouraged to visit New York State Power to Choose website to assist them in shopping for an energy supplier. The website has been enhanced to provide information on avail available fixed price energy options. Residential customers can easily find fixed price energy products for electricity and natural gas service. They can identify those that may, that may meet their needs. They can sort options according to the price and other factors and they can directly link to providers of those products. We will also continue our outreach and education efforts about winter preparedness and measures to help with winter bills. We focus on informing consumers about billing and payment options, financial assistance programs, and the steps to take it if the, and the steps to take if they are faced with energy with heat related energy emergency. Also, the department messages will focus on simple, affordable energy efficiency measures and available efficiency programs that will reduce usage, save money, and help the environment. The department's winter outreach program uses a variety of ways to get our message to consumers, including presentations to community groups and exhibits at public events. In addition, the department's AxPSC.com consumer website, the AxPSC1 toll-free information line, and the New York State Power to Choose website and our call center staff are additional resources for customers. Other resources for our winter outreach program include plain language publications. While all of our, while all of our publications are printed in English and Spanish, we have also translated several of the publications used in our winter program into Chinese, Haitian Creole, Italian, Korean, and Russian. To further extend the reach of our program, we partner with organizations and communities across the state. We invite our network of consumer leaders to work with us to reach as many New Yorkers as possible. We give presentations to community groups and provide copies of our publications free of charge so they can share the information with their constituents. In addition to our winter outreach program, we continue to work closely with the utility companies. 
Each utility has developed and provided staff with its outreach plan to alert customers about steps taken to mitigate price volatility, increase availability of fixed price options, and ways consumers can manage their bills. Some utilities have begun outreach as early as September, while others are currently implementing their programs. The companies are planning a wide range of customer education programs and are using a variety of tools to reach customers, including paid media advertisements, press releases, bill messages and inserts, newsletters, partnership with human service organizations, on hold telephone messages, companies, customer advocates, employee training sessions, and social media such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and website features. Staff will monitor the implementation of the utility company's outreach and education plans and work with them to make modifications as needed throughout the heating season. In conclusion, the Office of Consumer Services is implementing a proactive winter energy outreach and education program designed to ensure that all customers of New York's energy utilities have access to information and programs they need to manage their winter energy bills and use energy efficiently. Staff will continue to monitor the need for additional outreach and education efforts as the season unfolds. Thank you. Thank you, Lerner. First of all, um, let me just uh, observation. I'm very pleased to see that there are more opportunities for customers to uh, engage in fixed price contracts. I think uh, the ability to avoid price spikes by being able to, to have that that chance to do that is is critical and uh, appreciative. Also, the fact that I know staff is working with the ESCOs as well to get the word out on, on these contracts. So. The efforts on that and, and certainly the efforts on improving our own website and giving people an opportunity to shop and get more information I think are are critical. It, this is, um, you know, to me there's uh, certainly the most important thing we can do along with making sure that the adequacy of supply is the adequacy of information. And uh, one of the things that I think is going to be important moving forward as we look at REV and uh, other efforts we're making in the industry is recognizing that for consumers, being able to get a predictable price for supply is sort of one tool to help manage your energy costs. The other tools, of course, energy efficiency, being able to reduce your consumption and also be able to use things like demand response participation, smart technologies, et cetera, to all think about it as a sort of a total management product. So one of the things that uh, while we're not deal on the agenda today, I would ask uh, Raj, you and Doug as you continue to work on these is let's get something going to make sure that when we're sitting here next winter, the um, quivers and the arrows in the quiver, I always get that wrong, quivers in the arrow, arrows in the quiver, are, include not only much more tools around pricing and information or even before next summer, but also around how do we get people so that they're reducing consumption as well as having these demand response markets become more animated is another element, both to help manage the volatility of the price, but also looking at the total bill to the customer. So I think this is, like every market, it's going to continue to get built and built and built. I think these are great improvements, but uh, we're far from done in terms of, I think, what we can do in this state. A absolutely, uh, Chairman. You raise uh, an important resource that has, in my view, not been tapped adequately or strategically, uh, the demand side of the equation. And um, as you said, not only would it help manage price volatility and bill volatility, but also uh, help from a reliability perspective as well. If we can get more uh, strategically uh, dynamic load management, um, it's, it's one of the few products where you learn the price after you use it. Uh, there may be other ways of uh, providing and, and getting customers animated, excited, and in, in participating on the demand side. In a, in a convenient, profitable way, so it makes sense for them to engage in demand uh, management and use that as a resource 
uh, to meet the system needs and reduce price volatility. I think we should be engaged in that. Uh, so I would board. ask, following on this, let's get going. Yes. Um, with the groups, not just with the uh, the retailers, the marketers, the utilities, and um, you know, we we there's no reason to wait. This is if not, anything is low regret, no regrets. It's it's saving those kilowatts. And, 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 just, and just quickly to add to that, uh, and in speaking with a lot of the ESCOs now, uh, the difference is what they're doing now for mid-sized commercial customers and, and starting to do for, for residential customers uh, is tremendous. So a, a lot of new uh, efforts, a lot of new thinking as a result of technology changes, consumer demand, and so on. So we are seeing some of these products that were previously available mostly to the larger commercial customers starting to filter down. Uh, as, as technology uh, improves. Do you want to, can you give us, so it's a teaser, but can you give us a couple examples? Well, okay. Some not by these, name, by company, but if you get types with, of things you're saying. With the technology. Sure. Yeah, so a lot of technology is home energy management, for example, or, or commercial office space management where uh, uh, smart devices are provided by the energy services company uh, along with uh, periodic information that goes back to the customer. So. The, the, the ESCO then uh, uh, determines or, or assists the customer by providing information and tips and other 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 um, other, other information. I'll just leave it at that at, as to how the the uh, customer can then better use energy uh, more effectively, Incl including uh, in some cases detailed information on an appliance by appliance basis, how the appliance is performing. So again, these are uh, at some levels they're conceptual for residential, but uh, we are seeing these kind of technologies become more and more available uh, uh, to mass market customers. Okay. The other thing that um, and Doug well, or Lorna that I think is important um, coming out of last winter, we know that a lot of people in New York really had difficulty paying their bills. And you might want to touch on so that anyone watching, but to sort of how we're redoubling our efforts around um, dealing with arrearages and potential terminations? Sure. Uh, first of all, I, I, um, I don't want anybody to, to uh, lose track of our underlying regulations in New York. Uh, the Home Energy Fair Practices Act is the strongest set of protections for energy customers in the country. Uh, it provides a whole slew of um, protections for customers who are payment troubled, including lots of uh, rights in terms of how they're made aware of um, um, their their situation and that and and the the potential for having their service terminated ultimately, uh, as well as the right to obtain uh, deferred payment agreements at at terms that meet their financial needs can be as low as ten dollars a month. So those protections are very very strong. Uh, utilities are very comfortable and very familiar with implementing them. Um, and we, we see that, you know, year to year. So we monitor uh, utility compliance with HEFPA. Uh, we certainly look at complaint trends. Um, we also look at uh, analysis of the utility termination, service termination practices, as well as their uh, building up of arrears. So uh, this summer, for example, we noticed that one utility appeared to have changed its termination practices. and. Uh, at a staff level, we were able to work with them to um, uh, reduce those aggressive, what I would characterize as aggressive practices at the time. So it's an ongoing uh, effort, uh, looking at complaints, looking at uh, utility practices. Uh, and again, as, as the chair has indicated, this is something that we're looking for, looking at with a fresh eye as well going forward, both in the context of REV and other initiatives. Yes. Sure. A lot of people use budget billing in New York, and it seems like there's a potential to confuse budget billing with fixed price options. Um, budget billing is an average of variable prices over the course of a year, and it adjusts depending on how those prices end up, whereas fixed price is actually offering the consumer their ability to fix the rate per kilowatt hour, but it doesn't fix the price, their bill on an average. Can those be combined to some degree? And do consumers, are we doing anything to try to inform consumers kind of a, I guess, 
the good news is that there are options. The bad news is there are a little bit confusing options. Yeah, I hadn't thought about the combination, again, with the, uh, the fixed price being only offered by ESCOs. Right. Uh, so it would have to be an ESCO product that then is saying, in addition to offering you a fixed price, I'm then going to, you know, uh, allow you to budget that that commodity over the course of the year. And I don't, I'm turning around to see if Michael Corso wants to add something to this, but certainly at the delivery level, um, you know, the utilities and the budget billing um, uh, and for util and for commodity service provided by utilities is something that's. Uh, well established, but you raised a you raised a interesting concept at uh, at the ESCO level with a fixed price product. I'll just add uh, thanks, Doug, uh, to uh, Commissioner Brown. Your question is a good one. I think the answer is yes, it can be combined, since the billing is mostly done by the utility. It would just be constructed as an average over a period of the bill, whatever that bill would be, and it would be reconciled. But I think that can be done. We'll look into it to firm that answer up and get back to you. But I sense my, my sense is that actually can be done. So, Michael and Doug, I mean, that would be a lead lag issue. I mean, when you do a fixed price billing is in advance, you're fixing the price on a forward basis. When we do the budget billing, it's to be able to, when you have, you're not able to pay current bills to lag it. So it would extend the period, essentially extend the period of time of the fixed price, but then you would have a layering effect, I assume, of the new period. That would but be budget the, billing is actually being used by lots of people who can well afford to pay on a, they just like the yeah the certainty, of, certainty right. of the monthly bill. I mean, one is a certain, but right, but I, I would think that's a, that if you do fixed, as long as it's at the right price, then it seems like you wouldn't, the budget would be just an extension of that price. But you potentially could be in a new period. I guess the reason I'm asking the question, Excuse it sounds me. like you may have to take utility product to get the budget billing. And if you get ESCO product, you can do the fixed price. And I'm, the question, and nobody has to answer it this second, is is there a way that consumers can understand the difference, one, and can they take advantage of those two products, too? We'll answer it and get back to you. Thank you. Thanks. Commissioner Akinpar. Okay, I want to get back to the fixed price option. Um, when I had my briefing, I asked the question about should we be having a policy definition so it's helpful to consumers to understand exactly what a fixed price option is? Another good question. I think the confusion that we've seen so far uh, has been very limited to uh, ESCOs who have, for whatever reason, chosen not to honor what you and I would think is a, is a fixed price contract. This past winter, uh, we saw two ESCOs. I ind indicated in the briefing that there was one, went back and checked, mm -hmm. there were two ESCOs that we learned in New York State uh, had interpreted their fixed price contracts so as to in particular, had interpreted the force majeure provision of their fixed price contracts very broadly so as to include the uh, events of last winter, uh, which we didn't, even at a staff level, obviously saw that that was uh, not appropriate. So we were able to address that, fix that uh, for all customers, not only the customers who complained to us, uh, but those ESCOs recognized the um, short-sightedness, let's say, of, their, of, of that interpretation. Uh, so going forward, and what we do on a, frankly on a daily basis is we have people look at complaints on a daily basis to try to identify any new concerns of that kind of nature. Uh, our outreach staff, uh, believe me, when we're out in the field, uh, there's no hesit hesitancy on the part of utility uh, consumers to talk about complaints uh, on, on anything. So we hear also from our outreach staff. And also we have contacts with other states. Um, and, I know, and I know I, I get information from many of you uh, the chair, et cetera, um, speaking with other other states about, quote, problem companies there. Right. And so we, uh, again, I'll, I'll, to get back to your question, though, it's, it's uh, the experience that we've had has been with uh, questionable interpretation of fixed was really limited to last winter in the case of two out of, you know, more than 150 ESCOs. Mm -hmm. I, I think we have a great opportunity 
to share very important information. And, you know, I go back all the time as a former legislator. Legislators are always looking at every level, whether it's the state, it's the county, or even the local town board members and supervisors uh, to give information to their constituents. So I really think that if we can develop a good piece of information to share with other levels of government, um, we have then the ability to expand the knowledge of consumers. And I, th I think that's really important. Uh, as many, you know, as you stated in here, we know everything is, you know, technologically advanced. However, there is a lot of people who still like to have a piece of paper in their hand uh, or when they walk into a local town hall and that's the level of government that people really seem to understand best, that they know that there's information, they see it somewhere posted, they can take it home with them and look at it rather than, I don't know that everyone in the state of New York is coming to our website. Uh, <laughs> as good as it is. Um, so I think there again, the opportunity to um, get more people who will hand out our information, I think is really important. Uh, in response to your question, Commissioner, we do have printed materials that we, um, we have a mailing. As, as, as we speak, we are in the process of doing a massive mailing to include libraries, municipal officials, um, community organizations, a, you know, such as like AAR, big organization, AARP, Chamber of Commerce, and stuff like that. So we do have the printed materials uh, that provide all this information to the consumers who are apt not to deal with technology at all. Good. Uh, I but I think, I again, if we can piggyback on these other levels of government, I think that's really important. I, I, you know, I think we should lead that effort. Also, you know, like the, 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 uh, the DSS offices, social service offices, food pantries, places like that, we try to get the information, the printed materials there. Good. And I mean, in doing outreach throughout the state, I've gone to places where I've seen it. And, you know, when we do public statement hearings and I check out the, their board and what information they carry. And mm -hmm. when the opportunity presents itself, we'll ask them, you know, are you willing to have our materials here? And more often than not, the answer is yes. Good. Also, a question about HEAP. Uh, do we know what's going to be available as far as HEAP assistance this year? Michael, yeah. I'm, I'm waiting for you to answer. Mike, yeah, I think it's about ready to. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, yeah, the status of HEAP at the moment, uh, we just recently received information that the federal government re uh, released more funds. So New York is going to have just short of what it had last year. The net effect of that is that the, the payments are expected to be a little lower this year than they were last. Utility customers will get a regular heat payment of $350 this year, as opposed to last year, I believe it was $375 or $400. Um, but the heat program will be extended through March, where it was going to be closed in January. Very good. So there is um, good news on that front. And I believe the numbers are that we received, the uh, New York State received $344 million for heat this year. But last year it was $366. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. I think, um, Commissioner Akinpora, to your, to your point and your question, one of the things that uh, we're working, this, the department is looking at, and I think as agency we need to continue to work on, is the issue of building consumer confidence. So uh, not only is in terms of resolving complaints, but you've hit on what I think is one of the key issues, is when we have product definition is looking at our, our own regulations to make sure that just like uh, sort of FTC regulations, when people buy a firm product, they know what they're getting. And uh, it's something that I know staff is looking into to see if we can get better definition as well as better transparency. I would also note, um, which I think is good, is that in addition to our website, utility websites, ESCO websites, they're actually now some what I call kind of kayak type websites that are commercial websites. If you put in your zip code, 
they'll tell you what vendors are in the area and what they're offering in terms of products. So hopefully the market will continue to develop, and if we can look for ways to boost it, uh, we certainly will. We should because, you know, getting consumers that confidence is the only way they're going to pick these products. So, Commissioner, Commissioner Berman. Thank you. Um, Lorna, congratulations. I know this was your first time speaking um, at session. So Thank you. It's very nice um, that you are. Um, I just want to follow up on the budget billing and the fixed price um, and looking at that, which I think is important. But I just want to make sure that when we do so, that we we – go back to what has been historical um, on some of um, uh, the uh, working with the ESCOs um, in that we do do a um, significant um, outreach and understand exactly what is already out there and what can be done depending on the ESCO and depending on the utility. Um, I'm not so sure that um, it's, it's uh, you know, an apples to apples comparison and depending on um, some of the ESCOs they may be able to do things um, uh, differently without the reliance on the utility product per se. So I just want to make sure that we are carefully um, looking at that and analyzing it um, and, and making some recommendations that may be helpful, but also making sure that it's helpful not just to us but to the customers um, and that it's also not sort of driven by us, but it's driven by um, what the customers and, and the market um, uh, is, is interested in and can uh, deliver. Um, and for me, it's very important that we are proactive in consumer outreach and education, not just, it's not just the responsibility of the utilities and the ESCOs, it's the responsibility of the commission um, and, and the staff to be um, as proactive as possible. And it's not just a matter of being heard, but it's a matter of whether uh, the information and the outreach that we're doing is relevant and trustworthy. Um, and looking at how we can improve that is always um, very important. And, you know, as to the power to choose website, um, I think that if we continue to focus on whether that uh, and the changes that are, are made are actually helpful um, to uh, customers. I think that's um, very key so that we are um, not just providing um, a lot of data, but we're actually providing um, easily accessible data. Um, what to one person might be easy to another um, is, is not necessarily or is it not necessarily relevant and just making sure that we are doing um, a reality check on that um, is, is very helpful because it is a lot of information and, and we've um, got to make sure that we are uh, clearly targeting it and getting the information out there um, in, a, um, in, a, in a useful way. Um, so that's all that I have to say, but thank you and Lorna, congratulations. Thank you. We have one more discussion item, and um, why don't we go through that if, I, if everyone's okay with that, and then we'll take a quick break. So um, with that, uh, the, the uh, next item for discussion is our review of our gas emergency preparedness, and Pat Rochelle, Rachel Shell is going to be prepare, presenting that. That doesn't mean you guys get to go to the bathroom. Next item is item uh, 101, which is the review of gas emergency preparedness. Pat Rachel is going to be speaking. He's a utility engineer with the Office of Electric, Gas, and Water, and I know Kevin Speichert's here as well. Good morning, both of you. Go ahead, Pat. Good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon. 
Uh, today I'm here to discuss with you a informational update on a December 2013 order that direct, directed the gas utilities to file updated gas emergency plans, including consideration of uh, 46 best practices. Just a little background. Uh, just a little background. Uh, since its inception, the Gas Safety Code Part 255 has required natural gas pipeline operators to have an emergency plan. This requirement and its associated plans in response to it have evolved over the years uh, in basically a linear fashion based on industry practices and technology. In the last few years, we've seen a significant rise both in the size and the frequency of natural disasters that we've seen our gas utilities responding to, uh, significant weather events, flooding, uh, superstorm standees and such. And it seemed that it took a significant step forward both in scope, magnitude, and the size of the response that these utilities are required to do. In fall of 2013, staff hosted a uh, pipeline safety seminar in which a group of pipeline operators and safety representatives from both federal and state governments uh, developed a list of best practices for these emergency plans. These best practices became the ca uh, basis for the case 13G0484, which was designed to increase the focus and improve gas emergency plans. The 11 major natural gas distribution utilities were required to review the 46 best practices listed in the appendix to that order for possible incorporation into their emergency plans. Once that order was sent out, they had up to 60 days in which to file their review, file with us their revised emergency plans, identifying those best practices in the plans or which ones they had not yet incorporated but intended to for those best practices that they did not currently adhere to or were in process of incorporating. Uh, the utilities were required to provide a technical justification to staff as to why they had not yet adopted it. All of the 11 major natural gas distribution utilities complied with the order. Uh, all the staff received eight plans to review uh, natural, national grids, three gas utilities sections, all operate under the same plan and the two hydrodrola companies also operate under a single plan as well. All these plans were submitted by February 28th of 2014, and then staff began to conduct their initial review. Staff found that none of the operators or utilities uh, provided a, an acceptable justification for exclusion of any of the best practices. The plans were reviewed for compliance with the existing code requirements for emergency plans 255, 615, which has 19 separate requirements, and also for the incorporation of the 46 best practices that were included in the appendix of the order. As far as a review of compliance with 255, 615, from the eight plans, staff identified 53 instances, ranging anywhere from three to 12 per plan, of code issues, the most frequent being procedures did not include the availability of equipment, personnel, equipment, tools, materials. Uh, to put it succinctly, that was the procedures did not address usually um, availability of local responding resources for the gas utilities. They did not address their local first responders, fire department, police departments in sufficient enough detail to make it appropriate for the plan. They also failed to uh, not have procedures adequately addressing notifying and coordinating with local first responders, public officials, fire department, police. And that you tended to be usually the case of pre-incident coordination. Not so much coordination once the event took place or post-incident, but getting ahead of the game and getting out front and coordinating with these officials and local first responders ahead of time. Staff reviewed all the plans for acceptance of the 46 best practices for each plan. And we found 141 instances uh, ranging between eight to 30 per plan. 
in terms of not adequately addressing or failing to adopt uh, one of the best practices. One of the most common was the use of GPS technology uh, to identify location of critical facilities, those facilities that either control pressure or control shutoffs on a natural gas system that would be need to be located and probably uh, operated during an incident. Uh, second one goes hand in hand with one of the code issues was that identification of emergency response equipment its locations. Again, that was typically uh, not so much the utilities own resources, but those resources they rely upon from their local first responders. As a follow-up to our review, uh, the results were communicated to each of the utilities in a written letter. They were given 30 days to respond back to staff, uh, addressing staff's comments regarding both the code issues and the area's concern of the best practices. Thir after the 30 days, the responses were all received in an appropriate time frame. The vast majority of those code issues and areas of current concerns that staff had addressed or had identified has been addressed by the utilities. Uh, at, th at this time, the, uh, the remaining issues that may be out there are going to be then again addressed uh, in a written format that are still remaining with the utilities, and then they will at that time have a chance to respond. Some areas where we may uh, have to continue to work upon would be fostering uh, this coordination between the gas utilities and their local uh, responders, the fire, police departments, local utility, our local officials, community, uh, excuse me, county emerging, emergency management uh, to foster that and get uh, to facilitate that. And also the use of GPS and or any other technologies that may become evolving useful in terms of emergency response and locating equipment and facilities that would be necessary in the uh, events that would take place in emergency response. In conclusion, uh, recent events have shown the need for more robust emergency plans from these gas distribution utilities. Uh, the Commission has recognized that by issuing the order for the best practices acceptance. Uh, the natural gas utilities have responded appropriately and in a timely manner and have worked with staff to meet this goal. Staff fully accepts, fully expects full acceptance of all 46 best practices by the natural gas utilities involved in the order. And staff can, uh, expects to have continued improvement to these plans through uh, standing code requirements for continuous improvement on these plans. At this time, I'd like to address any questions you may have. Thank you. Um, first of all, I, I, you know, I think we probably had all saw that the lack of compliance, and I think everyone's at the dais uh, blood pressure went up just a tad. But uh, I'm glad to see that you know folks have, that the utilities have been responsive. But um, your point is well taken. We need to continue to focus on this area. Obviously, uh, we've been doing electric emergency planning for a long time, gas emergency planning, somewhat a, of a more recent phenomenon for us, but um, clearly given the, the recent events, you know, it's, it's critical. When would you, ex you said it was 60 days where you expect to hear back from the utilities for their further review? After completing the uh, re review of the revised plan, staff expects to send out the results within the next week. Uh, in a letter to the utilities, and then from that point, they would have 60 days to respond. At this point, we have um, three plans that we still have, uh, would like to see some further improvement upon. Okay. Three out of the eight. Um, I don't think we need a, uh, you know, maybe a full presentation, but um, Kevin or Raj, I think at that end of the period, um, it would like, I'd like to get a back, a report back to the commission. Um, either indicating full compliance or, or next steps. I think it's, you know, th this shouldn't be, these are plans. We should be able to expect 100% compliance. We can do that and we will do that. Thank you. Any further questions, comments? Commissioner Akinpour. When working with local emergency preparedness, uh, 
uh, firefighters. You know, in our state, we have paid firefighters and volunteer firefighters. Usually with the volunteer firefighters, the county office of emergency management usually coordinates those efforts. So we're still going along that same road. Uh, yes, ma'am. It's some of the plans were to the, to the minimal extent of coordination with local fire and police will be done through the 911 system. And staff felt that there, there is enough of it, there is enough time ahead of time to go ahead and start coordinating with your county emergency management office and directly down to the local fire departments, be they uh, career or volunteer, there is enough time for pre-planning to work with those personnel, even recognizing the fact that the volunteer fire department tends to have a relatively annual high turnover rate in those who are in their leadership position. Um, but the availability for drilling and emergency planning, those items that are required by the gas utilities already by the safety code, there is that chance to include these people and these organizations ahead of time and start to work with them and be aware of what their actual capabilities are, what their volunteer situation tends to um, really play havoc with their response capabilities. As you know, in, in some areas, the they don't have a lot of people have the availability to respond because, again, it's volunteer, less people are volunteering today, and they're at work. Very, uh, very. They could be at work, you know, if they live on Long Island, uh, they may be working in Manhattan. That's not going to help the situation. Very familiar, ma'am. I've been on both sides of the coin. I've been a volunteer firefighter. God, you're making me feel so old, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Thank my mother. She raised me, right? Yes. <laughs> So, again, in addressing all these things, I think, you know, all that needs to be taken into consideration to make sure that the coverage is there and, you know, responding along with the utility. Who's going to be on the scene first? Mm -hmm. We've been doing a lot of outreach with uh, um, the utilities to uh, try to get them to enhance the communication between the local fire departments, particularly the uh, volunteers and the utilities themselves just to make sure that both um, expectations are known when, uh, you know, when you show up to, the, to a scene, what you should do, what you shouldn't do, those types of things are known from both perspectives. Right. And then, of course, getting the public to buy in with, if you smell something, yes. call. Yes. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Berman. Um, thank you very much. I, I just want to um, clarify the order that was done back in December of 2013 uh, with the 46 best practices laid out came about um, after discussions um, and um, meetings with um, the relevant stakeholders. And I think there's no question that everybody um, is of the same mindset that safety is paramount, um, that what we're doing to prepare for an emergency is absolutely essential. And so the 46 best practices are really, um, you know, I don't think in question in terms of uh, disagreements on it. It's really a, um, the, the December 2013 order was really a formalizing the continued coordination and working with everyone to make sure that we all understood what was being done um, in uh, each uh, area and with each utility so that we were all on the same page. And if there needed to be um, looking at what might work in one area versus another, this was putting it all together and then having everyone talk about it so that something that maybe one utility wasn't doing, um, they could look to see if it worked um, for them, depending on the, the community's um, uh, needs and, and how to implement that. So that it, it's not that when we talk about non-compliance, I don't want sort of the takeaway to be that um, folks um, are not uh, embracing the safety component and the need for emergency preparedness. In fact, I would say that that's uh, – that they're uh, absolutely embracing that and making sure that we are all on the same page. And part of this is also an education for us of 
what is happening and what tweaks need to be made um, that in the implementation of those best practices. So I just, you know, I, and, and going forward, the end is, is we're not looking for the perfect um, written document. We're looking for the perfect um, plan that works in real life application for that particular utility and that particular community. And that may change and we need to be flexible to the interpretation and the implementation of those items. Um, so I think it's very important that um, that is why there has been um, going back and forth with staff and the utilities on on how it all is working and, and the continuing dialogue. Um, and, you know, just on that note, I really did want to do, um, I, I guess, a shout out to National Grid on their recent first responder safety program, their online training program, which um, I, I did myself take. Um, and I thought it was very, very helpful. Um, I, I'm not a first responder, um, but I did find it um, valuable. And I am going to be looking for feedback on um, the folks that uh, are first responders responders that, that um, take the program, what, what they think about it, and also um, how this uh, uh, web training can be utilized in other fashions. So I thought it was, um, it, you know, excellent on National Grid's part and, um, you know, looking also to, to what other utilities are already doing um, in that area as well. So We were very happy with that training to uh, the National Grid. Um, first responder training is a very good product. And just a comment, Commissioner Berman, um, it has been a collaborative effort right from the beginning with the safety seminar developing this. I mean, it was uh, about 20% of the time the seminar was spent just on this topic of developing the best practices with both inputs from all the stakeholders, be it regulatory personnel or pipeline operators, uh, both actually representatives from interstate and interstate, both gas and liquid. So everybody right from the beginning had a really good chance to uh, put their ideas forth and their best practices and get them all implemented into the 46 that were eventually adopted. Commissioner, sir. I'd just like to chime in that <clears throat> I think you're doing very good, effective work. An excellent job, very professional job. I'm happy to see that you're collaborating, that you're working effectively with the utilities and holding their feet to the fire. I, um, thank you. I, I, I would add to that. I, I appreciate that um, where we are is, is that the first step is the articulation of the plans and making sure that's right is, is critical, recognizing that plans, it's an iterative process. We have plans we have, and hopefully we don't have events, but we have events. We learn to see if our procedures need to change based on events. But I do think it's critical, and I want to underscore, is that the first step of having an executable plan is to be able to articulate what you're doing clearly, because that forces you to think about, well, what are you going to do? And I think this best practices sharing is a critical component of us and utilities, frankly, and the communities having the assurances that they've thought out what they're going to do in the event of an event and, and at least have a process. We see this with disasters. If you haven't thought it through, then you're sort of in the midst of a disaster trying to do things real time, which is not a good place to be. So I do think what work we're doing here is, is really important. Um, and again, we'll, we'll close on that. Yes, we think the grid work and the, and the online training is great. We're hoping to see lots more of that. So with that, um, we're going to move to the – oh, Commissioner Brown, did you have – I'm waiting for the break. Oh, okay. <laughs> Be okay. Before the break, let me just uh, make a comment that there's a lot of work that went into these reviews from staff, and I was remiss not pointing out even on the previous panel, there's a lot of staff effort that went into putting those presentations together and, and working with the stakeholders and getting the information and giving it to you. You beat me to – I think this is a – Great review. I know this is the first time we've done a winter. For the course. electric industry, is the first time we've done a winter review. I think it's it's great and obviously going to be something we're going to continue to, to want to do, but uh, it is a huge amount of work on staff, and we're appreciative. Thank you. And we'll take a five-minute break, seven-minute break. <laughs>